Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Rachel Fenlon, and I am the host of this show, Classical Revolution, here on iDagio. I'm really thrilled to be joined today by not only a great musician and a great artist, but also a very great friend of mine. Sammy Musa is a Canadian composer and conductor. Uh, he is the winner of many prestigious prizes, including the Hindemith Prize, the Siemens Prize, uh, last year, he was awarded the fellowship at the Villa Massimo, where he spent a year in Rome. Sammy has, has been commissioned as a composer by the Vienna Philharmonic, the Dutch National Opera, or, uh, Dutch National Opera the Deutsche Symphony Orchestra Berlin, the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, Montreal Symphony. And as a conductor, he has performed with the Bavarian State Opera Orchestra, the Vienna Radio Orchestra, the MDR Leipzig, the Zurich Chamber Orchestra, and he's actually um, also, as a conductor, performed uh, or per recorded two albums with Deutsche Grammophon. Um, he looks forward to next year appearing with the NDR Radio Philharmonie and also the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra as a conductor. He is published exclusively, exclusively by Durand, and um, I'm really just really thrilled to welcome him on the show today. So please welcome Sammy Musa. Hi, Sammy. Hi, Rachel. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, yeah, thank you. I'm so happy to have you here. Welcome. My pleasure. Um, Sammy, I love to begin just by asking uh, what your introduction to music was and whether there was a specific musical memory or a musical moment that sort of sparked your lifelong passion for music. I cannot remember of a specific moment, um, but what, what, one thing I can say is there was no music at home really. My parents were not big um, music listeners, but uh, I found in a, in a piece of furniture, two very big box sets of uh, LPs. And one of them was the ninth symphonies of Beethoven. And the other one was uh, Ravel's complete orchestral works, uh, but very strange interpretation, but not strange, but I mean a particular interpretation because it was the box set of Seiji Ozawa and the Boston Symphony, which is not okay. uh, maybe the most uh, common, um, I mean, let's say, reference recording of, of those works, but I really adored it. And uh, so those were my first classical recordings, and that's how I, I think, heard music, uh, classical music for the first time. Okay. And do you feel like there were any really early indications that you might become a composer? Were there any just moments where you were very creative or making sounds? or like, Do you have any memories of that? Not really. For me, composing uh, came a bit later around, I think I was about 11 or 12. And that's a moment when it, it was not so much about wanting to create sounds of more wanting to express myself. So it was more like some people write poems or some people, uh, yeah, especially poetry when you're a teenager. For me, it was like writing music. Okay. So it was my, yeah. Sammy, what is so interesting about you, and I think not a lot of people know, is that you're largely self-taught, or at least a, a, a huge part of your life before you entered your formal education was self-taught. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about what the challenges you feel were, and maybe what the advantages you feel were of that experience. Yeah, I mean, the thing is, the biography is... Uh is a piece of literature and I wouldn't say it's a fiction because everything happened, it's true, but it's not, uh, let's put it that way, the map is not the territory. So if the biography is the, is the map, it's not really telling the whole story. And um, so for me, music happened uh, because of a self necessity to express myself and but even more important than expressing myself, because it started before wanting to express myself, was more to feel alive and feel emotions and feel human. And that's where really music happened to me, for me. And so, so my education with music starts with myself and recordings, myself with scores, myself with books of history or whatever the topic was. And, and uh, so out of curiosity, then you search and then you find things. And, and that, that's where I learned basically everything. And then of course you go to school and you, go, you do, do the typical things with what ends up in the biography, but it might not be uh, essential in the sense of 
forming uh, yourself as an artist or forming yourself as a, as a personality. I think that probably happened before. I don't know if anything makes sense. I don't know if it makes sense to you. Yeah. No, it, it definitely makes sense. I think what I'm still, what I'd love to hear you talk or elaborate on is whether you feel in retrospect, like watching peers and colleagues having gone through very different, you know, for example, myself having studied piano since I was five with a teacher. I mean, what do you think? I suppose it's hard to be that objective with yourself, but what was that like to really delve into that world of music without, without any formality in a way? Well, I mean, I had piano lessons when I was young, but I was never good at it. And it was never really, there was never a relationship between my love for music and my piano lessons. Those were two different things. And actually, indeed, my piano lessons didn't, I didn't pursue it for, for that long because it didn't, it didn't work emotionally. I didn't get what I was expecting or not even expecting. I, while learning the piano, I didn't even feel I was doing music. So it was even worse than that. Like, totally a complete dissociation of, of the two things. Interesting. So, yeah. So, but I'm not answering your question, am I? Well, it's okay. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's hard to have that kind of objectivity about yourself, right? About your experience, because your experience was yours. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's so fascinating because it's so rare in classical music, I think is the thing. It's such a highly kind of. Well, it's a very structured and very um, traditional art form. Uh, which I think is great because the tradition is for me very, very important. Uh, but it leads to a form of conservatism where it has to be as, always as, the same way. And I think that's a bit problematic, I think. Yeah. Or let's say I think it did or it does prevent some talents to emerge because, um, especially in some countries like France, uh, I'm not, I won't talk about that too long, but just an example. In France, it's very, very regimented. I mean, there's a limit, age limit to enter the conservatory mm -hmm. and so on, and you're very, so it's kind of, I think, in eliminating some potential talents. I think that's uh, unfortunate. Yeah. Um, I'm so curious about your compositional process. So um, for those of you tuning in, you definitely, we, we've attached Sammy's discography as well as a playlist that he curated for us today of inspirational pieces. And Sammy's music, it's very special. It has a very special, unique sound world that I fell in love with the first time I ever heard it. And so, and it, it's sort of a question that I've never asked you as a friend, but I'm so curious what your process is with a piece. Um, I'm wondering what the first elements are that come to you, that come together. Is it always the same for you? Does that process change? Um, no, it's always different, but it's also always the same. So I'll explain. What is always the same is once I finish a piece or even more specifically, when I'm writing a piece, doing it currently, it's the last one. So I will, I will, I will feel that it's the last piece I'm writing. And when I finish, I always feel indeed that it's the last one. And, uh, and I need a lot of time in between pieces. So when I finish a piece, I cannot just start right away a new piece. I always need several even months in between. Um, I find it very, very difficult to start a piece. But that might be just because of procrastination. Um, that could be also a reason. I don't know. Um, but you see, I'm telling you all the secrets today. Um, <laughs> but I, I'm not sure what the reason is. Probably procrastination, actually. Because I think there's no reason why I couldn't be able to write a new piece once one is finished but or maybe it's a form of exhaustion i don't know so that's how it works but then well, when, when, when sorry yeah. i interrupted you no 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 okay no when no but, no i interrupted you <laughs> there's a little delay i think that's why but when i start a piece i just try to um depending on the length it's not the same Kind of procedure but let's say like an average length not too long not too short or rather short mm -hmm. as well i try to think what's the kind of emotion place i want to be in and how does that sound like so those are very general questions but then you have to and then what's difficult to make a decision 
because they're different ways of expressing the same kind of emotional idea. I say emotional idea to make it simple, but it's a bit more complex than that. Let's say musical idea. Um, and then, then you find the tools, the means, expressive means to, to convey that, that expression that you want to, to express. Fascinating. I feel it's, like uh, it makes no sense what I said, I, but... <laughs> Do you feel like... I'm, I'm always curious with composers about this. I suppose it's this, it's an art form for me that seems just so, it's almost like wizardry, right? So do you feel that there's something that you're ultimately trying to express through your work as a composer? Or is it every piece you're trying to express something and you, is there, so, I suppose my, my question would be, is there some sort of ultimate goal for you as a composer? Well, the ultimate goal is not technical. The ulti ultimate goal, uh, uh, it's not only as a composer, as a musician in general. I think that's like the, the whole, the story of my life or what I try to do with my life. It's mm -hmm. based on emotions, communication, and uh, sharing beauty, mm -hmm. show beauty. Maybe we'll get to that point um, and um, et cetera. So that's, that's, that's yeah. the ultimate goal. And that's the goal for every work. That's the goal for the, the life. You know, it's like yeah. Yeah. general thing. Yes. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a great, inter there are a few really great interviews with you that I, that I enjoyed watching today. Um, and in one of them, I want to I wanna quote you a little bit here. And this was with La, La Cine Musicale, which is a French Canadian music magazine. And you say, every commission I accept is something I want to do. Nothing is more important than the other. Every project is important because everyone is chosen. Um, so I'm wondering if you can talk about how you choose commissions. What, what has to speak to you as a composer? Um, well, first of all, I have to say that I'm a very fortunate musician because it's very, I think um, it's, it's a very privileged situation I am at the moment where I can, of course, choose. And, but I've always been that way, even when I had less, let's say, offers. Uh, it has always been important to me. And I'd rather do nothing than do something that is uh, not fitting with an artistic, general artistic goal. So um, that means that I have ideas, things I always wanted to do, or things I feel like I should be doing at a certain point. I try to make it fit the agenda. That's, that's let's say, the most ideal version, but then you have people, organizations, institutions, they, they, they ask you for certain things which you didn't think about. And, and sometimes you think it doesn't work with you and then you refuse or there, and it can happen, it happened to me that it opens new doors and things that you have never thought you would do, things you never wanted to do. And then suddenly you find yourself in a situation where, oh my God, I, I, I have an idea for this. This can open a new door for me. And for instance, this happened to me. I'll give you an example. Mm -hmm. uh, I wrote one piece for organ and orchestra called A Globe Itself Unfolding. And that piece is, yeah. And when that piece was, when I was asked to do it, I didn't want to do it because I didn't want to write for organ and even less for organ and orchestra. Uh, it felt like writing a piece for two orchestras and I, I didn't know what to do and I didn't feel comfortable with the, the, uh, the project, but that was an example where I, I, I took organ lessons and I went to with my friend Elizabeth Zavatka in Luzern and I went to different organs and she showed me and then I played and I tried and then I found, okay, I think I can do something with this. I have an idea. And, and that piece is the beginning of a new, I don't want to say period, that's a bit pompous word, but the new beginning in my, in my work. Uh, I found something in, in, in this piece. Interesting. And also, I mean, with this kind of instrument that you never, you would never would have imagined understanding and then it opening up a whole, a whole sound world that you have to be asked to do. You wouldn't have just gone to the organ yourself. Exactly. No, that's, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I'd love to talk to you 
to you about your work as a conductor too. So it's it's something that's also so special about you is that you're you're a great conductor. Um, and I would start off by asking what you feel the role of music is in society today. You know, just a very easy casual question, but um, but I yeah, I'm curious your thoughts on that on on what our roles are as musicians in society. That, that's not a, a, a simple or easy question. That's, that's a very complex question. And I think um, I can give you maybe one answer, but I think this is a, a topic that could require hours of discussion. Um, but for me at the moment, because I think, in, I think music has different um, powers depending on the time it lives in, because people have different ears and, and are ready to accept certain things and other periods they, they are not. And, but I feel like uh, after coming through romanticism and modernity and by seeing the state of the world, I feel that classical music especially, and also even popular music, which I'm not so familiar with, but I, I think it's, I think every genre of music has, can, can do this and do it when it's well done. It's the, it's the power of, of sharing um, on an emotional level. So what I like is when music is not a discourse, when music is not a political discourse, for example, I, I'm not a fan of this. Um, I think, and, and when you achieve this, when you achieve this, this kind of special communication, you are expressing, you're communicating on, on a superior level, a metaphysical level, um, which is very special, which is very powerful. And, and I think it gives humans a sense of being alive and also a sense of empathy. And that, that's for me very, very important. I think empathy is lacking in this world. And, and I think music is an extraordinary powerful tool of fostering empathy. So. Mm. Do you feel, I mean, something that you and I have talked about before is that right now and today, to, right now today, the role of music has changed a lot since, and, and politically has changed a lot since, um, you know, since the past and, and also imagining a future. And, you know, we've talked about how we're really at a particular time where music necessarily can't necessarily be political, but would you agree with that? What What do you think about this? Well, I mean, a lot of artists are political. Mm. Uh, I think there are limitations. I just, I don't know. I just feel like in classical music, the audience of classical music is very particular, and I don't think a concert or a classical music project can have a deep, profound, lasting effect on society. That doesn't mean I wish it was the case. Of course, I wish it was the case. I wish we had that power. I wish we could achieve that. But I think at the moment with the structure of society as we see it today, I don't think it's the place for those things to happen. So personally, I decided, or I decided, or I, I didn't decide, it just happened that way that I, I won't try to do something that is not my role, that I don't perceive to be my role. At the moment, it might change, I don't know. But at the moment, I feel my, my role is a conveyor of emotions. I, I say that word a lot because I think that's very, very important. It's like a drug, you know? And, and once you've touched it, um, I think you want more and then you grow as a human. Yeah, so it's, it's less about sort of big events and more about a, a process or what music offers the individual and their own relationship with it versus, you know, a big, one big event or a concert or something. Yes, because there are different, there are different kind of levels of, of uh, linking because of course there's the musicians together on stage because mm -hmm. that's also a very particular form of, of communication. Then you have the expression, when you have a, a conductor in the orchestra, that's another, level of communication and you have the music making and the audience as another level mm. one by one but also when you're in a concert hall you have this group that is living something at the moment in silence which I think is very important and very beautiful 
And that makes me think, that made me think many years ago that music is, uh, um, is a form of a spiritual experience. Um, and, uh, and I think, that, I think it's, it's really a beautiful thing, really. Mm. Mm. Um, talking about you as a conductor, I'm, I'm, I'm curious about how you feel. I mean, this is a role that requires a lot of decision making, right? Um, and I'm curious how flexible that role is when you are responsible for determining how a piece goes. How flexible do you allow yourself to be in interpretation? What's that process like for you? Well, that well, was a very interesting question because when I was younger, I planned everything. I took every decision beforehand and I had a very clear vision of what I wanted and how I would achieve it. And, and everything was really decided. Mm -hmm. Growing older and gaining a little bit more experience, um, I realized that this doesn't work because being a performer with a group of people as a leader is not about imposing necessarily your ideas, is to also receive what comes from this organism, this group, because they also have a personality and you have to, I think, that's my, my vision of it, you have to respect this, you have to even embrace, embrace it. And, and if you don't like the sound of an orchestra, you might want to become a music director and change it. I think it's, it's, it's better to just go and work with an orchestra where you, you, you kind of like specificities of it and then you build on it. And, and the rehearsal process is great because you have this feedback from the orchestra, so you hear certain things and then, of course, it gives you ideas as, a, as an interpreter, as a, as a decision maker, as you said. But at the same time, that doesn't mean that you don't have a plan for where you want to go. Of course you do. But I think one has to be open to what comes from, from the orchestra. And the more I did this and the more I do it, the more, the more beautiful it is. <laughs> Uh, the more human it is and less um, constructive it is. So that's something I find very fascinating. I love no really, it's not necessarily necessary to talk that much even, right? Because mm -hmm. this is also, everyone has ears and all the members of the orchestra, they have ears, they know what's going on. And, um, and I think that's great. I love that. Um, it's, I think it's, yeah, it's just, it's such, um, it's so refreshing to hear, actually, that it, just to stay open and also to consider that the surprises that can come in a spun, in, in the moment with the orchestra, with, with these great pieces and great performers. Um, I, I would love to hear you talk a little bit about I think I would love to, to first talk about, there's, a, there's another quote of yours, which I, which I love. I think it's just quite provocative. And, and it's um, in an or, uh, interview with Ludwig van Magazine. And you're talking about academia um, and sort of your, your trajectory, especially that you studied um, for the majority in Europe. And you, you, you say, um, one must not forget that the only thing that's possible in Europe is modernity. There's no alternative. Wondering if you could just talk a little bit about that. Oh, that's a very exhausting topic, but we can talk about it. <laughs> exhausting because it's something that I've been confronted with since uh, almost 15 years in mm -hmm. Europe. Is that, um, but it's changing. So that's why it's a bit less exhausting than it was. Um, there is a form of consensus, uh, or let's put this in the past tense. I think there has been, there has been a form of consist, consensus of um, what the history of music is. That means that you have, you know, this typical thing, you have Bach and then you have, the, you know, Haydn and Mozart and Beethoven and Schubert and etc. And then you end up with Schoenberg and then you have, then you have a little bit of Bartok, a little bit of Stravinsky, and then you 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 have a person like Boulez says, okay, I'm the synthesis of all those things, and this is the history of music. And I think this is a, this is, 
this is wrong, that's a mistake, and that's, that's not how things really happen, and that's not the truth of it. Um, and uh, that's what I meant when I said this, is that there's not, because the, this focus on modernity, the modernity of the 20th century, especially, I mean, precisely, mm -hmm. we're still living it, apparently, for some people. And I think we're musically out of it. We should be out of it. So that's a little bit the, the, the topic. I see. So it's almost less of innovation and more that we're stuck, actually kind of hindered by this idea. Is that? Well, well I think in every period, people, um, especially in a transition, transitional period, as we are in since, I think, probably since the 80s, um, it's a, it's a, it's, it, we are definitely not in modernity anymore. But because of the academism and because of the schools, of course, this is what they're generating. They're generating, of course, teachers are there and they're teaching those ideologies. So this is still existing, although it's not relevant anymore. We are not living that period anymore. And um, I think any sensible person would feel that. Um, but that being said, I don't know where we are. I don't know where we're going. I mean, I'm not, I don't have a crystal ball. I just know that we are not living in, a, in the society of 1960. Definitely not. That's for sure. This is really interesting because now it makes me think, if we know we're living in a transition period of music, how does one approach that? How does a composer approach that? I mean, if you know you're in this... What, I mean, you're, we're not a part of per, perhaps an epoch or perhaps a very defined time, so. Well, that's very interesting because there, there are two things with that. I think one mm -hmm. can answer composing and conducting. With composing, it's very, it's very clear that you have this academism avant-garde, which is very easy to follow because all the institutions were built around this. They work, they accept it, they know how it works and the piece is played, it's not played again, and then you have a new commission, et cetera, and that, that's how it works. And uh, you become a teacher, and then you have more students, et cetera, and this is acad academism, and it has always existed. So this is not me telling this should not exist. It's just that yeah. this is the structure of, of the, the system. But then, um, and then you have other artists, um, me and others, and and I'm not I'm and I'm not saying I'm right or they're wrong or they're right etc. I, I I don't make a judgment on that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just that I don't feel any I don't feel that they have any cultural relevance. So I try to to do my own thing. Maybe it's not culturally relevant either, but it's but I know that academism is not for sure. So I'll try something else. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then what was the second part of that? In conducting, is very interesting because modernity in conducting um, manifests itself in many different ways. Um, one of them is with the technology of recording, and then you have Kayan's recordings, beautiful uh, mastering, mm -hmm. and et cetera. And so that was a trend. And, 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 but then you have also this historical informed practice no, historically informed practice, um, which is also another form of modernity. In, in, but I think even today, we feel that this kind of vision of music making is it's interesting. I, I really, personally, I like it. But one has to accept that it's, 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 um, it's a period and it's great. We can keep doing it. But I think I see, I see this evolving and many conductors already do it. And, and I, I count myself part of them, trying to learn from this, but also, you know, learn from different other ways of doing music and not just be so um, specialized. And, um, and I think this is, this is something I value very much. Yeah. Do you feel like you have to fight for that? Do you feel that you have had to fight for that? Or, I mean, that it, it gets now a bit kind of more biographical, but... What, what was that? Was that a decision for you at some point when you kind of really saw your place within this classical music genre and... Oh, not at all. No, no. It's, 
it's no, of course, all this. I, what everything I'm discussing now is something that I I can analyze. I do analyze uh, after it happened. It's easy. It's easy to say now because it happened, and, and yeah. I you know my life until now. But the, the, there was no decision. It's, it was just a feeling that I have to do what I have to do, and it's, so it's not any calculus. It's not any. There was no process making into doing this decision. Taking this decision was just. <laughs> I have to express, I mean, I feel this way towards music. I feel this way towards art. And as an artist, I want to express myself in this particular way. And then it happened that way. And my music evolved also in that way or my uh, interpretation style. It just evolves in a natural way. And then that's who I am. And then of course, if I analyze it as, as we just did before, then I can understand what the patterns are and where it comes from. Yeah. I think I mean I think I suppose it's it's fascinating on a, in a way because it it has so much integrity and I think that that's um, that's not easy somehow to to maintain um, so that's probably why we we love your music so much but um, no so I was wondering whether that was a fight at some point or was a challenge but well there was a fight there was a fight I did fight yeah, yeah <laughs> okay did. okay good that's what I want to hear. <laughs> Often, often, a lot of fights, of course. I mean, it's, it's it's art, you know, there's the art, the idealism of the art and, and doing it in concert and being an audience member, it's it's great. Uh, but there's also some fighting sometimes is necessary if you want to do something and it's not what people want you to do. Or So either you don't do it Either you do something else because that's accepted or you keep doing it and you hope it works. And that was my, my way of doing it. I thought I just have a life. I cannot lie to myself and do something that doesn't work with my own inner life. So just, just do it and, and, and yeah, I hope it works. <laughs> <laughs> um, I feel like I, I have the advantage in this interview uh, because I'm your friend as well, so <laughs> I, I can throw throw some things in. But uh, but something I, that's always fascinated me about you and that I would love to talk about is I know you're a great lover of literature and you're a reader. And what kind of influence does that play in your life? Um, in your in your artistic inner life, what what does that look like for you? Well, literature like music is in art in general. And I think that's the beauty of uh, the culture we have, we share the Western culture in general, is um, that we, are, we have a tendency to archive. We have a tendency to keep, want to keep things. And, and that's, I think, marvelous. And literature, like music, are testimonies of, of a time. Uh, that's very general also testimonies of ways of thinking, testimonies of expressions, any, any human activity. And, and literature is especially strong because it's based on words and, and you can convey more specific things than, than with music. And um, so, yes, I read a lot. I'm a big, big, uh, big literature lover, absolutely. Mm -hmm. I think that's uh, actually something I've, in a way I never thought about is that um, it's the specificity of the words that lend themselves to that specific time as well that make that makes it so important it's interesting really interesting um, and I mean so your work you're, you're definitely as I've sung one of your pieces um, which was a William Blake text and I can see that you're quite influenced by him because you've set now four songs to his poetry. Is that right? Um, I think three. It I might think, be okay. three, but whatever. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Well, William Blake is a fascinating figure. And, and, and you see, William Blake is, uh, because I come from a system of education in French, so William Blake doesn't have any mm -hmm. role in this. Um, so it was not part of my general education. That's something that I acquired later by choice in life. And uh, when I discovered William Blake, I was completely 
amazed by the talent. And he said things that I always wanted to say or that I wanted, I, I wish I wanted to say, let's put it that way, be a bit more humble even. And, uh, and I found that absolutely fascinating. And I, I also found that it was a musical language. Um, um, yeah, William Blake, wonderful. <laughs> and then he's a painter even, you know, a wonderful yeah, painter. Definitely. And also, you've also been quite influenced by Michelangelo as well, is that? I, I've heard yeah. of Yes, I wrote a song cycle and text by Michelangelo. Michelangelo is known as a painter, of course, and a sculptor, everyone knows him. And, and he has a very small um, work output, but he wrote many, 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 many sonnets. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's, 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 it's not necessarily the best poetry ever written, but uh, what I find very, very interesting with this output is that it's very homogeneous and so it, it's also very genuine because he always went in the same kind of things, um, always expressed a bit differently, sometimes the same way, but very, I, I found this very fascinating and, and very beautiful and um, it touched me. So I, I did set some of his, of his texts, yes. Mm. I mean, I would, I would, there's, there's, there's so many things I want to ask you, even though I have the, um, again, the advantage of just asking you so many times. But um, I know that a comp composer that you talk a lot about who's quite influential to you is Bruckner. And I'm oh. just curious if you could kind of explain what his influence is on you as a composer or as a comp conductor. Oh, um. I have not, I mean, now more than before, but I'm not a very patient person. Okay. Well, let's say that I was not patient as a, as a younger person. Now it's getting better with time. Um, my, mom, my mom told me it's, it should get better, it will. Uh, but anyways, and, um, and so both now when I was younger was a problem because you need patience um, to absorb a symphony. And I didn't have that patience. And for that reason, I never really cared about his, his works. And, and maybe around the age of maybe 18, I, I had the patience, a bit more patience, but still very juvenile. <laughs> I heard my first Volkner symphony on a recording and then I realized, oh my God, this is really very special. And, and since then it accompanied my, my life and I, I I listen to this music very, very often. It's very important, and it's 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 a form of expression that is so. Uh, it's it's very human in one way because, of course, Okna is a human being, but also extremely um, abstract. There's a form of abstraction that I really, really admire uh, because it's it's emotional, but it's abstract. And, and I think the best concert music is, is made of those elements. Um, so it's touching, but you don't even know really, you know why if you're a musician, you have technical ways of expressing this or telling why, but there's something touching you that is beyond just because there's no topic. It's, yeah. So uh, yeah, Volkner is very uh, wonderful. I, 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 guess, I guess people come on your show and say, oh, Volkner is great, oh, Beethoven is great. So I will say Bogner is great, but I mean, it's more than great, it's fundamental. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I asked the question to you specifically because I think you're the only person I know who's as passionate about Bruckner as you are. So I had to ask you, you know. Um, yeah, Bruckner is one of my favorite composers. I mean, when I'm asked who's my favorite composer, very often I will say Bruckner. Yeah, um, I've heard you say it. Yeah. Um, no, but it, it, it's also interesting to hear you talk about about the abstract and about how that speaks to you. Um, that's also that's also very very interesting. Um, well, I would probably wrap up this conversation, which could go for many hours, um, and ask you the question about uh, you know apropos the title of the show, which is when and how do you feel music can be revolutionary. Well, music was a revolution, um, but a very slow, 
slow, but not that slow. If you look, I mean, I, I want to talk about music. Let's talk about our music, Western classical music. Yeah. If you read the history of music, if you try to understand it, where it came from, it came from the people and then the church, and then this developed itself into this incredible, complex, beautiful, rich thing. And that is a revolution. It's a re revolution of the human mind. That's, that's the revolution. And it's an ongoing one. And, and, and a revolution doesn't mean to overthrow the past. I think it's the opposite of this. I think it's to understand the past, um, to learn from it. And rather than try to always pretend that, oh, we are better because we're now, we're contemporaries. I don't think that. I think people that came before were absolutely extraordinary people because they gave us what we have today. And, and I think that is also the strength of classical music is to be conscious of that and to, to play with this, um, to play with the past, to be conscious of the past, all of it, and, and try to Im suggest something for the contemporaries. I don't see, I don't see music as an art form of um, moving forward. It moves forward by itself. It's not a goal. It just happens by itself. If you try to push it or to impose it on it, I think then if you're too conscious of it, I think then is when you, uh, uh, you, you fall in the category of ideology. And yeah. ideology in art is dangerous um, because music is so fragile. And, yes. and we know it by history, how music can be manipulated and destroyed. And, and uh, yeah, we, the 20th century is an absolutely incredible a testimony of that. So that's what I would say. I would say that the music we do is for the people of today. They are important. Wow, I love that so much. <laughs> Sammy, thank you so much for making time and for your thoughts. My pleasure, Rachel. My pleasure. I watched the show and uh, you asked me very early on to come in on the show and uh, but it's a big honor because I, I've watched so many other interviews and it's really inspiring. So thank you for doing this and, uh, and see you very soon. Thank you. Yeah, see you very soon. Um, and to everyone who tuned in, um, definitely make sure you check out Sammy's gorgeous, inspiring playlist, which is linked to this episode here underneath. And otherwise I'll see you all next week. Thank you again.